got a club championship, you're a stick, period. I don't care who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I also joined Caves Valley there, which was an excellent place to play golf. Oh, yeah. Uh, excellent nice, place to yeah. play golf. Of course golf. you did. Of, of course, course I did. did. I said I can't drive by them. I, I have this problem. <laughs> Um, I will. I will not answer on the grounds that will incriminate myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. Can we back up? We got to go off script here, Rick. You have how many hole in ones? Eight. Oh, okay. He says matter of factly, <laughs> as if it's it. no big deal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Stick and Hack Show, a sophisticated and brilliant look into the world of golf from a stick and a hack. Now, your hosts, Mike Ryan and Adam Grubb. All right, everybody. Uh, welcome in. This is the Stick and Hack Show. I'm your host, Adam Grubb. The Hack. That's Mike Ryan right there. The Stick. It is good to see you, Mike. Uh, you know, we've had we've had a, a collection of guests here as as of recently that have been astronomical in fame and in fortune, in uh, in notoriety and popularity. All things we aren't. Our guests are. And that's exciting. Uh, this is quite possibly the greatest golf show in the free world, presented by the greatest golf club in the world without the course, Stick and Hack. And our guest today, Mike, is Coach Rick Neuheisel, CBS broadcaster, college football coach, amateur golfer, and now a guest, oh, singer songwriter, guitarist, and now a guest on the Stick and Hack show. Rick is going to be up uh, joining us here in just a little bit. You've, you've known him for many, many years. He was an uh, incredible coach. Uh, many colleges. Now he's on CBS. In fact, Brian Jones, our friend, our pal, pal of the show, liked the Stick and Hack show so much, he said someone else has got to deal with this abuse. So he got his buddy Rick Neuheisel to be on the show. So Rick's coming up here in just a minute. Uh, let's let's go. Uh, let's go first up here, Mike. Now the first of college football. Okay. This might come surprise to you. Now, as you know, I don't watch college football, but so I had to, I had to do some, some deep, uh, deep digging here, but, uh, this is first up the very first of college football. The birth of American football came in 1869 on college Avenue in New Brunswick, New Jersey. The game was between Rutgers university and the college of New Jersey, now known as Princeton university. There were 25 players on the field for both teams. And the rules were based on the London football association which did not allow players to either pick up or throw the ball. The game resembled a form of soccer or rugby, something that viewed in context of football today would look like one extended fumble with players trying to trick or kick and hit the ball across the opposing team's goal line. That was the original football. The game resulted in a 6-4 victory for Rutgers and attracted around 100 spectators. Just seven years after the first game was played, representatives from Columbia, Harvard, Princeton, and Yale came together to propose the first rules of what is now recognized as American football. The representatives met at uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, November the 23rd, 1876. Why we know that date? Sounds like somebody just made that up, right? You probably it sound did. Like I, I probably did. <laughs> November 23rd, 1876. This is where Walter Camp emerged as a les- legendary father of American football. Camp created guideline fans are familiar with today, such as the line of scrimmage, the center to quarterback snap, a system of downs and propose that each team should have no more than 11 players on the field. Now the first associated press rankings were released in 1936. The rankings included 20 teams and helped determine a college football champion. Minnesota was the first team to sit atop the AP rankings at the end of the season, becoming the 1936 college football champs. That Mike is how college football started. Did you know that you were going to come to the stick and hack show and get that type of college football history lesson? Yeah, I always get these these great tidbits from you, and I, you know, I know they're probably semi true, just because we don't know. Nobody we know Shane didn't do out. any research, so I mean, <laughs> no. What who? What are they going to do? They're going to check me. They're going to fact check the stick and axe show. If you're oh, fact checking the stick and axe show, you, you already know. I think you already know. You will hear. You will hear a fact checker or two from from our fan base. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, why do we talk about college football today, Mike? Why don't you tell the American public? Why we're talking about college football today? Uh, because our the coach we have on um, Mr. Rick Neuheisel is incredible, and uh, you know we're excited to hear from him and and all of the his regales of of past. Here he is, everybody. Welcome in, Rick Neuheisel, uh, college football coach, CBS Sports analyst, and now guest on the Stick and Hack Show. Rick, how are you? I am wonderful. How are you boys doing today? Doing great, doing great. Thanks for taking some time here. Fantastic. So. Uh, 
you know, we're going to get into your into your golf story here in a second. But first, uh, I got to understand what the life of a college football coach is. You have coached uh, at several different universities, uh, NFL. You played football. Your sons played football. Your son's a coach. Uh, what is the college football pressure cooker like as a coach? And uh, is does it outweigh the pressure you put on yourself as a coach? Well, it's a great question. Uh, it's time consuming. There's no question because as a college football coach, you wear lots of hats. You are the general manager of your team. You're you're responsible for the roster. And in today's world, with uh, the transfer portal, high school recruiting, junior college recruiting, graduate transfers, your your roster is coming from all over the place. So you've got to be really mindful of, and because of the transfer portal, your roster can also be evaporating right before your eyes if you're not recruiting your own team as well. So you're watching it from uh, the prism of recruiting all the time. How am I going to get the best players? Because best players usually win. There's an old saying, it's not X's and O's, it's Jimmy's and Joe's. And make sure you've got enough Jimmy's and Joe's to go around. Uh, and that is a, an ever-evolving world, and it's never been more complicated than right now. You also are a fundraiser. You're out there, you know, helping with the boosters get excited about the program so that they'll uh, put their hard-earned money in, involved in the program. Uh, you work with uh, the academic people on campus, making sure your kids are there getting what they came for, which is a, uh, an education. Uh, you've got to make sure people are eligible. Uh, you've worked with the training department. Uh, it's a physical game. People are hurt all the time. How are we going to get the best possible uh, uh, medical treatment for our kids? You work with the strength and conditioning people. How are we going to make sure that our kids are developing like the teams we play? How are they going to get big and strong and all the different things that are necessary to be at your best? So it's, it's constantly evolving. Usually when everybody goes home at the end of the day, that's when you actually get to turn on the tape and watch football. The rest of the day is doing something else, but uh, it's a passion that uh, it's hard to get out of your system. Very few coaches leave the game voluntarily. They're usually asked, uh, given a pink slip and asked to leave and leave the keys to their, their courtesy car at the uh, desk as they're walking out the door. And But uh, it, it's been a passion of mine for a long time, and I'm thankful that I had the chance to coach. That's a good point, Rick, is that, that that pressure cooker that we talked about and, and, and the college now football is now a business. There's no doubt about it. We're going to get into that a little bit later. But uh, does the, the pressure that you put on yourself as a, as a coach and as a leader, is that more than the pressure that's coming from the university and the boosters and all of those people? And we hear these stories all the time. Has it gotten worse? Is it or is it was it manageable for you over the years where you it's almost like having a board of directors where you're like, OK, like, I'll, uh, I'll deal with you in a little bit. I've got a job to do today on the field, and I'm going to deal with that first. Well, pressure is an interesting word because I don't think we, uh, the successful college football coach feels pressure. I think they basically see a job that needs to get done, and they go about getting the job accomplished the best way they know how. And the more successful guys are the ones that trust their own instincts, that uh, believe in what they're their instincts tell them and and rely on that rather than information from outside sources because at the end of the day if it isn't successful you can look at yourself in the mirror and say at least I did it my way the old Frank Sinatra saying right uh, at, I, I want to make sure that uh, I did this my in the best way I knew how giving everything I had I, I never worried about losing a game or losing a job obviously I did both but uh, but I, I never worried about it. I just did the best I knew how and, and uh, was always satisfied when I looked in the mirror that I had done everything I could do. Rick, you talked about how much college football has evolved. And, and that story that, that Adam told earlier, you know, you kind of hear the simple beginnings of college football. And when you see the game today, are you happy with where it is or do you think it's become too big of a business? Well, the genie is out of the bottle, right? Uh, we are a giant business. We are an entertainment mogul. Uh, and the question is, because the pie grew so quickly and exponentially, were we mindful enough to monitor where it was headed? And the answer to that probably as we speak today is no. There was a great deal of greed that accompanied what happened to college football when 
a couple of schools, Georgia and Oklahoma, back in the 80s, took on the Supreme Court and their television rights. At that time, everybody's television rights were owned by the NCAA and so forth. And Georgia and Oklahoma said, we should own our own television rights and should be able to be on television as many times as we'd like to be. And they won that case. And because of it and the great you know, popularity of college football, the television dollars have grown enormously and are the reason that most athletic departments are so uh, bountiful as we, as we sit here today talking. The problem with that is we never really paid attention to the workforce, the players. And while we wanted to grow the pie of what we were giving them in the form of a scholarship, which is a, which is a reasonable uh, payment for services rendered, but as the pie grew, there needed to be more to go along with it. And we just didn't do that. We fought this amateur model and, uh, and I say we as a college football community, and because of it, now name, image, and likeness, transferring the, the freedom, free agency, if you will, the freedom to take your services where you want to go, are, are both in play at the same time. And now, just imagine, here's, here's the best way to explain it. Imagine the NFL playoffs, which we just saw, a great weekend of NFL playoffs. Imagine that Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo and uh, Matthew Stafford could all just now say, I'm raise my hand. I want to go someplace else and go for whoever pays me the most. That's what we have in college football. There's no contractual obligation to where you are. We all understand when the contract's up, but there is no contractual obligation now for the student athlete. And he can go wherever he is being more handsomely compensated, even though name, image and likeness was never supposed to be a recruiting incentive. It clearly is. And so we've got a long way to go to reel that genie in, if you will. And that's one of those things where it looks good on paper and everyone gets excited. And then you start to peel back the onion and you realize, oh, my God, there's there's more issues here than than we thought. This is not just about uh, a, a sharing the pie and giving people that, that the big bad wolf is getting all the all the apples that we need to, to bring some more for the villagers, which isn't a saying, by the way. I just made that up. So don't ever repeat it. But uh, that, that now that that is happening. It is one of those things where we got to look back and we go, oh, my God, there, there is a lot here. And, and this could go bad if we don't see ahead of time where the problems uh, arise. Is that basically what you're saying, Rick, is that, look, there's some good things here, but there's also some negatives that could that could affect colleges and people. Well, down the, the negatives are here. The negatives are here. The question is, how are we going to combat them and cut, get our arms around it so that the, the college football loving public can embrace the new brand that we are trying to uh, have them embrace. We, we have great games, we have great competition, everybody is enjoying it, but the balance of power has shifted such that there's only a few teams that play for the big prizes. And given the state of things as we see them today, that's not going to change and we're gonna lose interest regionally around the country. And so we have to get some parameters of back around this that makes sense for the student athlete, that they get their fair share of the pie and that uh, the college football viewing public uh, believes that this game is worth continuing to follow and love. All right, let's, uh, let's talk golf. Rick Neuheisel is the guest here on the Stick and Hack Show. I'm going to be honest uh, with you, Rick, when, the, when your boy Brian Jones told us that you were begging to be on the show, uh, it was an instant yes from us, uh, despite the unknown connection to golf. In fact, I'm not even sure you play golf. So the question is, are you a stick or are you a hack? Well, it all depends on where your perspective comes from. I have uh, loved golf since I was seven. Uh, the greatest Christmas present I ever got was under the tree at seven years old when uh, I saw this beautiful set of golf clubs, and I just knew they were for my dad, right? I, my dad played a little bit. So I was one of those guys who got up earlier than everybody else and, you know, kind of separated all the presents into little piles. I have three younger sisters, so I put all their piles and had mine just waiting for the next kid to wake up and let's get after it. And we got to the, the end of the deal and my dad says, Rick, you forgot something. And I said, no, I didn't forget anything. I know I found everything that was mine. He says, no, these golf clubs are for you. And we went and played that day. I shot 73. Now that was for nine holes, but uh, I have been a golf junkie since. 
and I have uh, a couple of club championships. I've uh, played in a bunch of great events. I love golf. I'm a one handicap, uh, a, a point one one point two index, and uh, I can't get enough. There you go, Mike. Fell so now, stick. yeah, love he's it. a stick. He's a stick. And so yet again, does that qualify I'm a as a stick? An island by myself. Does that qualify as a stick? Absolutely. Damn right it does, Rick. Absolutely. You're damn right it does. Absolutely. Proud of you. You got a club championship, you're a stick, period. I don't care who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it was 15 years ago and you're 15 handicapped. <laughs> no, no, it. these all happened post no, 50 absolutely. years old because I was coaching. There was no, uh, you, 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 you couldn't win That's on great. the golf course oh, yeah, when you're coaching. I, yeah, I have eight <laughs> holes in one and seven of them are after I got fired. <laughs> Hold on a second. Can we back up? We got to go off script here, Rick. You have how many hole in ones? Eight. Oh, okay. He says matter of factly, as if zero. it's no big deal. <laughs> I have zero. You so get enough holes to play, the eight. hole will get in the way. I, that's, that's a promise. Right. I, I got. <laughs> that's right. My God, eight. Congratulations. Well, that that makes your next question seem futile, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so first off. Where have you played? Who have you played with? What are, what are some of your go-to golf stories, Rick? Well, my wife will probably love to hop on here and tell you I belong to far too many clubs because uh, she pays the bills. And so when you're trying to make sense of why you belong to some place, the it's just too beautiful a place doesn't go very far with the missus. But uh, I, I, I have an addiction. I don't know what else to say to you. Every time I go someplace as a coach, I drive by a beautiful golf course, and then I go beg them to let me in, and they happily take my money, and I, I stay there. I'm still a member at Bel Air, which was right across the street from UCLA. That's a great place to play. I, I live now in Scottsdale, Arizona. I play at Phoenix Country Club, where they have the Schwab Cup. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the senior club champion there. I've been the senior club champion at Bel Air. Uh, I finished second, uh, in the senior club championship at Aldera, which is a place where I got fired at Washington. So every place I get fired, I go try to win a golf championship. So I have fonder memories about the place <laughs> so that I, when I return, I can focus That's on fantastic. that rather than, you know, the fact that I got shown the door by the, uh, brass and the university. So you, when you say addiction, you mean that in, in the sincerest, uh, form of the word it, and, and golf is an addiction and, and any, most of the guests that we have on here, they they have this this passion. You caught it early. Most people do. And when you're when you're watching golf, when you're when you drive by a golf course, when you're it's the middle of the winter here in the Midwest, uh, you, all we can think about is that is that next ray of sunshine and when the course is going to open. It is such a weird sport to have an addiction for. Well, it's the greatest combination of competitive zeal handling your own nerves because nothing moves until you do there's no reaction to it you have to picture a shot depending on you know what the stakes are whether it's a a two dollar nasa with your buddy whether it's a club championship what have you you have to handle all that and then you have to deal with the success or the failure and it's your concentration it's you and while all that's going on you're in one of the nicest places in the world. You're wearing clothes that you like, right? You walk into the shop and you, you get to pick out stuff that you think you look good in, whether or not that's a popular opinion or not, doesn't matter. You think it looks good. You uh, get to be in beautiful weather. You just pointed out the weather more often than not. And even when you decide that I'm going to go punish myself and go to a place like Ireland or the Oregon coast and get beat up with three club wind and rain and all that stuff, you actually, at the end of the round, say how fun that was. Uh, it's where I get my competitive fix. Those of us who grew up as athletes, whether we were playing high school, college, professional, where you can, as you grow older and your bones, you know, grow a little weary and you're, you're, you can't run, you can't jump maybe like you used to, golf is still there and golf is popular and it is, and the handicap system allows for everybody to play one another kind of in an equal way. And for that, you can play till you're under the ground and most people do. 
Uh, your career, Rick, has spanned uh, a few teams, uh, weird controversy around a March Madness pool, massive winning seasons uh, for, for the schools you coached uh, as a player and, and, and as, a, as, a, as a college coach, NFL. What do you think about most and what do you reflect back on when you look at your career today as just this is what it meant to me and this, is, this was my life? I'm very proud of my career. Uh, at the, my first two places, both Colorado and Washington, we won a bunch of games uh, at Washington. I, I finished twice in the top 10. We, I should say. We finished twice in the top 10 at Colorado in my four seasons there. We were once in the top 10, number three in the country, and Rose Bowl champs at uh, Washington. And I think everything would have gone along swimmingly had I been allowed to continue. Uh, you mentioned the March Madness pool that I was involved in, and it was a big misunderstanding. But unfortunately, when you get caught in legal imbroglios, or however you pronounce that word, uh, people run for cover. And unfortunately, that's what both the university and NCA did. And, and uh, I had to fight for my innocence and eventually won. But it kind of derailed my coaching career. I ended up going and coaching in the NFL with the Baltimore Ravens. And I'm thankful for that experience because I love the Ravens. Steve Bishotti, the owner there, is aces. Could not be a nicer person and uh, a better guy's guy to hang out with than Steve Bishotti. Uh I also joined Caves Valley there, which was an excellent place to play golf. Oh, yeah. Uh, excellent nice, place to yeah. play golf. Of course golf. you did. Of, of course, course I did. did. I said I can't drive by them. I, I have this problem. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I went to UCLA, which was my alma mater. And, you know, Terry Donnie, who gave me all these opportunities years ago, uh, I just went there at the wrong time. We, the, the, you know, administration was in a budgetary situation. The football program wasn't on its best uh, uh, footing from a recruiting standpoint. And we built it back up. Uh, Jimmy Mora, who took over for me, ended up winning nine, 10 and 10 his first three seasons there, primarily with a roster that we helped recruit. But uh, as is the case, if you're not winning now, they usually go tap somebody else on the shoulder. So uh, my career record is just a tick under 60%. Here's a fun fact. Do you realize that as a college football coach, if you coached over 100 and I think uh, 150 games, maybe it's a little less than that. If you're a 60% winning clip, you're eligible for the Hall of Fame. I was 60% before we played in the Pac-12 championship game, which we weren't supposed to play in because USC uh, was ineligible, so we ended up getting to play in it. We got beat by Oregon, so I cannot qualify for the Hall of Fame. Not that I would have gotten in anyway, but I would have been eligible. But I had to play one oh. more hole. <laughs> just oh, just oh a, God, it's, like, it's like the caddy it's handing you more, the seven iron when you needed the six. It. That's what it happened. <laughs> Rick oh, Neuheisel man. is the guest here on the Stick and Hack Show. What's more nerve-wracking for you, calling the plays on a last-minute drive down the field? Uh, let's see, moments before the red light, the red light goes on when you're live to the world on CBS, or 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 is it a five-footer to win a match against your buddy for twenty bucks? Not even close. It's the last. It's the latter. Listen, you've prepared <laughs> for the other two. You've yeah. prepared for the other two. Uh, you you ready for the final drive you know exactly what to do and it's it's business right you just handle it you know your kids are ready and you're ready to go and for the red light to go on that's fun uh that that's a kick that's exhilarating and let's talk ball right but that five footer because you've just gone through 17 holes of hell whether you you know get you had a two up lead now you're down there or you're coming from behind you, you that ball doesn't move until you strike it and all the thinking that goes in there is absolutely mandatory that it be the right kind of thinking. But that's a blast. That's why you keep coming back. I disagree, Rick. It's not a blast at <laughs> all. It's, it's a nerve wracking and makes, make, makes my heart uh, explode. Because he can't make it. I can't make it. I've never made it in the history of time. You just misread uh, it. Uh, as we close you, up your here. Your skills let's get are your... all there. You just misread it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. My, uh, per, good speed, good strike. Just a, just a bad line. How many times on tour do we watch the tour guy go back and look at the line again, right? He he didn't miss it. He didn't fan it. He didn't do it. Yeah, right. They all they all feel the same thing we feel. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Then they, they look they, at their they, caddy. They go like, you oh, well, miserable that should, idiot. That should move. That should <laughs> no. It shouldn't have. Been, it should have done exactly what it did. Right. <laughs> All right. So as we close up here, we get ready for uh, for the game. Let's uh, let's give us that that uh, halftime speech. The words to live by. The coaches. The coaches' words of Coach Rick Neuheisel. What do you say to the Stick and Hack members and listening audience? Uh, you know that 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 speech we all deserve from a coach. What do you say? Here's what I know about the great game of golf. If I could have interviewed every guy that ever coached with me, any assistant that I hired, if I could have gone 18 holes with them, I would have made every right decision. 18 holes of golf reveals everything you need to know about you, your character, your personality, whether you're fun to be with, whether you're not fun to be with, your competitive zeal, 18 holes of golf would be this. So when you're playing, make sure you reveal everything that needs to be revealed and why you're the kind of guy you should be. Either you define the moment or the moment defines you. Enjoy it. It just is the best thing going. There he is. That is what we needed, Mike. I want to go play golf. How about you? I can't, though, because it's four degrees outside. Uh, Rick Neuheisel is the guest here at the Stick and Hack Show. Rick, you're going to stick around and play uh, the game Sticker Hack with us, yes? We don't quit after nine. All right, we'll be back in just a moment. This is the Stick and Hack Show. Need some gear to rep your favorite golf brand? Visit the Stick and Hack Shop to explore our curated collection of exclusive merchandise. With a variety of styles of hats, shirts, and outerwear, we've got something for every golfer. Plus, shop our unique assortment of accessories, including putter covers, foam caddies, and more. Be sure to fill out our weekly cash grab survey to get a chance to win $25 to use at the shop. Visit the Stick and Hack Shop today to get what you need to look your best on and off the course. All right, we're back here at the Stick and Hack Show. I'm Adam Grubb, the hack that's Mike Ryan, the stick, and we are with head coach Rick Neuheisel from CBS Sports, college football coach, and uh, now a guest on the Stick and Hack Show, and apparently pretty damn good golfer, Mike, which I wasn't aware of until uh, just a, uh, recently. So, uh, Rick, here's what we do every show, and I know you know this because you listen to it, you watch it, you, you're, you're addicted to golf and the Stick and Hack Show. Uh, so the game is called Stick or Hack, all right? Now, either it's stick or it's hack. And uh, the category is singer-songwriters. Now, if memory serves, uh, you were on the Dan Patrick Show one time, and we're showcasing your ability to write and sing and play guitar, and you were amazing. Uh, so I figured this might make the most sense. Singer-songwriters, stick or hack. Okay, we're going to go through a list of 10 of them. Are you ready? Got it. Let's do it. Good. All right, here we go. Uh, we're going to go to you first, then Mike, then me. Stick or hack, uh, singer-songwriters, James Taylor. Hack. Uh, I'm going to go I'm hack. I'm so happy you said that. Hack? We got three hacks. Yeah. Right off the bat. 100%. I mean, I love his songs. You know, take to the highway. Don't you lend me your name. But that sounds like a ball that's way right off the tee. <laughs> of course we do. <laughs> it, we all love these people as men and as individuals. <laughs> okay. But the song is terrible. <laughs> uh, Bob Dylan. Uh, that voice just sounds hackish to me. Hack. Yeah. Um... I like his lyrics. I don't like his singing, so uh, I'm going to go hack. Okay, I'm going to go stick um, 100%. I grew up on Bob Dylan and Harry Chapin and uh, and others. My dad uh, celebrates the man's entire catalog, and uh, because dad is listening now, I have to go stick. I might not make it to uh, to the next family outing if I say hack. <laughs> Bob Dylan is a stick, despite uh, not being able to understand a word he says on, on stage. <laughs> uh, Neil Young, stick or hack? Oh, that's a stick. Yeah, I'm going to go stick with Neil Young for, for yep, sure. Yeah, stick as well. Except for folks in Alabama. It, 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 folks in Alabama, maybe not so much, but but everybody else, stick. If you don't get that reference, look it up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, indeed. Uh, what about uh, Paul Simon, stick or hack, singer-songwriter? Oh, he's a stick. Absolutely a stick. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I agree. Stick. Uh, Garfunkel, does that does Garfunkel bring him down to hack level, or is he still a stick even with uh, with art? Yeah, no, I'm still stick there. Uh, although Simon proved after the fact he was stick all by himself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he he totally did agree. He did. Uh, Willie Nelson, stick or hack? Stick. Come on, Are you kidding yeah. me? Stick. stick. Yeah, stick. Willie's a stick. Let's go to Luke and Bach, Texas and play 18. Okay. I guess I, I just won't answer it then. Um, I will I will not answer on the grounds that it'll incriminate myself. <laughs> uh, Jim Croce. Stick. Bad, bad yeah, Leroy stick. Brown. Are you kidding? Time in a <laughs> bottle? Are you kidding right, me? Stick. stick. Right. Okay, Rick, relax. That's all. We all agree with you. Stick all the way around for Jim Croce. All right. Uh, this is This one is a little tough. Sticker hack, singer-songwriters with the head coach uh, Rick Neuheisel, Chris Christofferson. 
just because he has, uh, you know, that kind of raspy voice, I'm going stick. Now, I don't know that he could sing a full, if you gave him karaoke night, you would probably no. kick him off the stage. 100%. But he's out. if he's just doing Christopherson songs, I'm stick with him. Okay, Mike. Uh, let's see if man. you go against Rick. You haven't yet. I gotta go. Ha- I gotta if go. You hack. can go against him. I, no, I gotta go. Hack. I'm just not that big a fan of his. I go hack all day. There's no Chris Christopherson. Sunday morning coming down. I mean, that just sounds like the final day of a tournament right there. Oh wow! Look absolutely. at you bringing it back. All right. I, I I I mean, I'm still hack, but you make a valid point. That's <laughs> what I do. I tried to with athletic directors when they're getting ready to fire me too, and they said, "Yeah, I'm staying with hack." That's exactly right. <laughs> uh johnny cash stick come on my name's johnny Thank cash Mike? Stick. Stick. stick yeah stick stick, stick. yep stick. all the way not stick. even a question gordon lightfoot on sticker hack singer songwriters with rick Neuheisel. well gordon Lightfoot. you know i actually like Gar- gordon lightfoot so i'm gonna say stick but i know where you guys are going i know where you're gonna go you 100 percent. you do well, maybe not Mike. Mike's agree with you the entire day. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, I, I'm my own man. Thank you very much. And I'm you, well, I, we can't wait to see that. I'm going stick. <laughs> I'm going hack. Gordon Lightfoot. Is sundown. We hack. play till sundown with Gordon about? Lightfoot. There oh, you go. My God, you could listen to one song from sun up to sundown. The wreck of Emma Fitzgerald. I mean, that is. What are we talking about here? Hack. Oh, man. Uh, all right, last one. Singer songwriter sticker hack with Rick Neuheisel. Jimmy Buffett. Touchdown. We have just green jacket, green jacket stick. Son of a son of a sailor. Are you kidding me? Uh, I know exactly. Yeah. I sang with Jimmy Buffett. You asked me to try. You cannot slide him into hack category. I'll hang. I'll put my headphones down. You have to believe in in, in Margaritaville. You have to be a parrot head. I'm stick with Jimmy Buffett, but I know exactly what Adam's going to say. Adam, don't do it. He's not going to say anything now because he's too scared. Before you jump in here, can I just give you a little information? I got on. I got to sing with Jimmy Buffett at Fiddler's Green in Denver, Colorado. I got on stage with him when I was coaching at Colorado. That's a cool do venue. Do you know who was in the band on percussion when I walked on stage in front of twenty thousand? Now, and we Axel did, Rowe. and we did the national anthem. We did Margaritaville. But Ed Bradley of 60 Minutes fame was on the bongos. Oh my God. 100%. And so was Ed Podolak of Kansas City Chief fame. Now the voice of the Iowa Hawkeyes, a color analyst. Ed Podolak and Ed Bradley, both in the percussion section. That's how cool Jimmy Buffett is. Rick Neuheisel is the guest here on the Stick and Extra. That's it. I ran out of time. We're done with the show. I can't I even have time to say what I wanted to say. If we did have time, I'd say he was a hack. I would say that the entire Parrotville, Parrot Margarita thing, the the people who go to the concert for the atmosphere and the whole thing, I think it's hack. You are the people our parents warned us about, Adam. You are the people our parents warned us about. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that our relationship has now hit a hit a, a bump. Uh, you and Mike can go off and play golf together. And, this and- is my dream. And play in three and a half hours and shoot par or whatever. Good for you guys. You can listen to Jimmy Buffett till the end of the day. All right. I'm going to be in the parking lot drinking beers. Uh, Rick Newhousel is the guest here on the Stick and Hack Show. Rick, my thanks to you. Uh, incredible appearance. We appreciate your time today and uh, and continued good luck there at the CBS. We we are excited as, as college football continues uh, here in just a few. They, they just stopped, but they've got the spring games. Then they're going to all of a sudden it's going to be college football season again. and You'll be out on the road uh, doing what you do best. So uh, thanks for being here. And hopefully, Rick, if our if our paths cross, we can play golf and listen to a couple singer-songwriters and maybe, maybe even listen to you play as well. That would be an incredible time. Adam, Mike, I appreciate it. It's been fun to be both a stick and a hack on your show. <laughs> Sounds good. There he goes, Rick Neuheisel. This is the Stick and Hack Show, the greatest golf show in the free world, possibly by the greatest golf club in the world without the course of Stick and Hack. Go to stickandhack.com and learn more about our amazing platform and go to YouTube to see Rick if you're listening to this and see our other videos and other po- podcasts as well on YouTube. Thank you all, everybody. And Mike, good luck. Best of wishes to you. Goodbye. Peace out, guys. Okay, we're done. 
This has been the Stick and Hack Show. Go to stickandhack.com to become a free member of the world's greatest golf club without the course.